The Resemblance Between the Reformation and Marxism Considering the course followed by the Reformers and its consequences, would it be paradoxical to conclude it put an end to the relative stability and equilibrium of a world in which man was less estranged from himself than we are at present? It would be easy, in fact, to find ourselves personally looking for a form of humanity that does not betray it, shunning those vacant lots, those suburbs and factories, whose appearance expresses the nature of industrial societies, and making our way towards some dead city, bristling with Gothic spires. We cannot deny that present-day humanity has lost the secret, kept until the current age, of giving itself a face in which it might recognize the splendor that is proper to it. Doubtless, the works of the Middle Ages, in a sense, were only things. They could rightly appear worthless to anyone who envisioned, beyond, in its inaccessible purity, the wealth that he attributed to God. And yet the medieval representation of society has the power today of evoking that lost intimacy. A church is perhaps a thing. It is little different from a barn, which clearly is a thing. A thing is what we know from without, what is given to us as a physical reality, verging on a utility, available without reserve. We cannot penetrate a thing, and it has no meaning other than its material qualities, adapted or not to some useful purpose, in the productive sense of the word. But the church expresses an intimate feeling, and addresses itself to intimate feeling. It is perhaps the thing that a building is, but the thing that a barn really is, is adapted to the gathering in of the crops. It comes down to the physical qualities that were given to it, measuring the costs against the anticipated advantages, in order to subordinate it to that use. The expression of intimacy in the church corresponds rather to the needless consumption of labour. From the start, the purpose of the edifice withdraws it from public utility, and this first movement is accentuated in a profusion of useless ornaments. For the construction of a church is not a profitable use of the available labour, but rather its consumption, the destruction of its utility. Intimacy is not expressed by a thing except on one condition, that this thing be essentially the opposite of a thing, the opposite of a product, of a commodity, a consumption and a sacrifice. Since intimate feeling is a consumption, it is consumption that expresses it, not a thing, which is its negation. The capitalist bourgeoisie relegated the construction of churches to a subordinate plane, preferring to construct factories instead. But the church dominated the whole system of the Middle Ages. It erected its steeples wherever men were grouped together for common works. Thus, it was clear and visible from afar that the basest works had a higher purpose, apart from their tangible interest. This purpose was the glory of God. But is not God, in a sense, a distant expression of man, in the anguish of the depths he perceives? That said, the longing for a bygone world is nonetheless based on a limited judgment. The regret that I might have for a time when the obscure intimacy of the animal was scarcely distinguished from the immense flux of the world indicates a power that is truly lost but it fails to recognize what matters more to me. Even if he has lost the world in leaving animality behind, man has nonetheless become that consciousness of having lost it which we are, and which is more, in a sense, than a possession of which the animal is not conscious. It is man, in a word, being that which alone matters to me, and which the animal cannot be. Likewise, the romantic longing for the Middle Ages is in fact only an abandonment. It has the meaning of a protest against the rise of industry versus the non-productive use of resources. It correlates with the opposition to the values given in the cathedrals of capitalist interest, to which modern society can be reduced. This longing refuses to see, at the basis of the industrial rise, the spirit of contestation and change, the need to go from all parts to the limit of the world's possibilities, it can doubtless be said of the Protestant critique of saintly works that it gave the world over to profane work, that the demand for divine purity only managed to exile the divine and to complete man's separation from it. It can be said, finally, that starting then, things dominated man, 
insofar as he lived for enterprise, and less and less in the present time. But domination is never total. And in a deep sense, it is only a comedy. It never deceives more than partly, while in the propitious darkness, a new truth turns stormy. The Protestant positing of an unattainable divinity, irreducible to the action-bound mind, no longer has any real meaning for us. One could even declare it absent from the world, having lost its connection to that uncompromising demand. The current Protestant way of thinking is more human, as if the positing were itself bound to resemble the divinity it defined. But this absence may be illusory, analogous to that of the traitor whom no one denounces and who is everywhere. In a limited sense, the Reformation has ceased to exert any action, yet it survives in the rigours of consciousness, in the lack of naivete, in the maturity of the modern world. Given the lethargy of the multitude, Calvin's subtle demand for integrity, the sharp-edged tension of reason, which is not satisfied with little and is never satisfied with itself, and an extremist and rebellious way of thinking take on the appearance of a pathetic vigil. The multitude has surrendered to the somnolence of production, living the mechanical existence, half ludicrous, half revolting, of things. But conscious thought reaches the last degree of alertness in the same movement. On the one hand, it pursues, in an extension of technical activity, the investigation that leads to an increasingly clear and distinct knowledge of things. In itself, science limits consciousness to objects. It does not lead to self-consciousness. It can know the subject only by taking it for an object, for a thing. But it contributes to the wakefulness by accustoming us to precision and by disappointing us, for it acknowledges its limits. It admits its powerlessness to arrive at self-consciousness. On the other hand, thought does not at all abandon, in the face of industrial development, man's basic desire to find himself, to have a sovereign existence, beyond a useful action that he cannot avoid. This desire has only become more insistent. Protestantism referred man's encounter with his truth to the other world. Marxism, which inherited its rigour, and gave a precise form to disorderly impulses, denies even more than Calvinism a tendency of man to look for himself directly when he acts. It resolutely excludes the foolishness of sentimental action. By reserving action for the changing of the material organisation, Marx clearly formulated that which Calvin had merely outlined, a radical independence of things, of the economy, in relation to other religious or generally affective concerns. Conversely, he implied the independence, with respect to action, of the return movement of man to himself, to the profundity, the intimacy of his being. This movement can take place only after the liberation is achieved, and only after the action is completed. This specific aspect of Marxism is usually overlooked. Marxism is charged with the confusion of which I speak above, for Marx, the solution of the material problem is sufficient. But for man, the fact of not being merely like a thing, but of being in a sovereign manner, in theory given as its unavoidable consequence, nonetheless remains different from a satisfactory response to material demands. Marx's originality in this regard lies in his wanting to achieve a moral result only negatively, by the elimination of material obstacles. This leads people to attribute an exclusive concern with material goods to him. They fail to notice, in the provocative clarity, his utter discretion and his aversion for religious forms, whereby man's truth is subordinated to hidden ends. The fundamental proposition of Marxism is to free the world of things, of the economy, entirely from every element that is extraneous to things, to the economy. It was by going to the limit of the possibilities implied in things, by complying with their demands without reservation, by replacing the government of particular interests with the government of things, by carrying to its ultimate consequences the movement that reduces man to the condition of a thing, that Marx was determined to reduce things to the condition of man, and man to the free disposition of himself.
In this perspective of man liberated through action, having effected a perfect adequation of himself to things, man would have them behind him, as it were. They would no longer enslave him. A new chapter would begin where man would finally be free to return to his own intimate truth, to freely dispose of the being that he will be, that he is not now because he is servile. But by the very fact of this position, which, as far as intimacy is concerned, dissolves away, offers nothing, Marxism is less the completion of the Calvinist project than a critique of capitalism, which it reproaches with having liberated things without rigour, without any other end, without any other law than chance and private interest.